Welcome to another special bonus edition of the Paul Ryder Tapes. This week, oh, we have a very, very special soul. He sported one of the most legendary haircuts in Manchester. He was a club DJ and a radio DJ for many, many years, but is most famous and legendary for using his organ to rapturous reception with the Inspiral Carpets, who are still gigging to this day. He is the lovely legend that is Clint Boone. Do you know much about what I'm doing? Did, did I explain to you or do you want me to tell you? I don't think more? so. I know, I know it was like you, you've done a project with Paul, a podcast related project. Right. So it's a continuation of that now, isn't right. it? Just decided to. Right. Well, what, yeah. yeah, what it is. So we broke up six years ago. Um, we had a year where we didn't get on very well, and then we just became yeah. really good friends. And I yeah. did a different podcast, and I played it to him because he's, I talk about him a bit in it. And I just wanted to make it was about dating, so I just wanted to make sure he was okay with it. And he was like, "Oh, this is brilliant. Oh, great." And from him listening to that came the idea of him doing a podcast with me because he wanted to yeah. write a book to correct all the lies that had been spouted over the years about the Mondays. And I knew he'd never get round to it. So I said, why don't you talk a book to me? So I'll prompt you with the questions and you just tell your story in as much depth as you can. And like yeah. warts and all, all the bad stuff, all the drug addiction stuff, all the breakdown stuff, the infidelities, yeah. all the crap as well as the Monday stuff and the good stuff. So he agreed to do that. And, and literally, he came round to my house every Sunday for about six months. And we did. he couldn't do much more than about an hour at a time because it really took it out of him because it was like therapy, yeah. really. I can um, imagine, yeah. And then the idea was that we'd take the transcripts of the show and produce a book so it's in his words, but he doesn't have to physically write it. So yeah. we then the idea was as well that we would bring in some other people who he'd rub shoulders with just to give their perspective, and he would me him me and him would talk to that person and include them in the conversation. But we thought, well, we'll get the life story down first, and then that'll be the launch pad for these other conversations. Mm. Twelve days after he finished recording his life story, he died. And it was like mm. twelve days. Like it, it was really bizarre Incredible. because. The, I think both of us felt a real sense of urgency to get it finished before he went to England. It was really odd. And then when I got the call saying that he was dead, I said, oh, I knew. Yeah, I, it was like, yeah. I didn't know, but it was, it was yeah. so, so odd. Anyway, so I'm left with about 15 hours of recording of him, his whole life story in depth. So now I'm going back over it and, and in, in, in interviewing people who, we, who he talks about within that just to yeah and I'll, I'll drop them in and we might create both so we filmed everything as well so it was primarily going to be a podcast but we filmed everything so I decided to film all the interviews as well and I'm just going to make a, a long detailed series and maybe some of the 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 bigger interviews will become like bonus episodes of their own that are related to it so it's his story obviously a lot of that is the Mondays but it's also all the rest of the the stuff as well so yeah, obviously, brilliant. so so obviously, you you've been a, a a figure in his life. I know he had huge love and respect for you. You were very supportive mm. of his of his big arm stuff. I remember going with him a couple of times when you interviewed him yeah. when you were at XFM. XFM, um, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I just thought, and it was a new. I remember you DJing at Chico's fundraiser. So you've been yeah. a friend for a long, long, many, many years. So I just thought yeah. it'd be very appropriate to ask you to be involved Perfect, in yeah. this as well. No, so I'm flattered. I'd have been I'd have been offended if you didn't invite me to be part of it. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's lovely. Um, yeah, and he he was obviously you know Paul. He was a very kind of un, understated man, but he did feel very deeply for people and was always very touched when when people showed him love, you know, and, and was very grateful for that, but maybe couldn't articulate it very well. I mean, I think we all have mm. trouble articulating feelings to people. So it's just nice yeah. that we've got the opportunity to, to actually talk at a kind of deeper level, really, I guess. Yeah. So, um, so I guess the best place to start is at the very beginning and, and talk about how you first came across Paul and the Mondays and your first impressions and your first experiences with them. The first time I came across the Mondays was, I think it was January of 
um, 85. And New Order were doing a couple of gigs around the north of England. So one was in Blackburn. And then the night after, they played in Leeds at Tiffany's. And I think the band that played in Blackburn were called um, Blue in Heaven. Oh, right, yeah. And then, and then the band that played in Leeds the next night, I'd never heard of them, they were called Happy Mondays. And I thought, I wonder if this is a bit of a trick, like, because it's like Blue in Heaven and Happy Mondays. It's like Happy in Heaven and Blue Monday. So I thought, is this, a, is this like a little New Order sort of gag? Anyway, there were two completely different bands. Happy Mondays that night was just like nothing I'd, I'd ever seen. It was just like a bunch of lads waiting for a buzz, like, like but making music at the same time. It just looked so ramshackle and and the way they dressed, it was like they were just, they, they looked like they'd not got dressed up to do the gig. You know what I mean? Just These were the clothes that just worn through the day, track suits and whatever else. And So I was smitten with the band from the first time I saw them. And then it was soon after that, I'd start to hear the music being played on, I don't even know if they'd made a record at that point. I don't think they made any records. So when I started hearing records like um, The Egg, um, which I think Tony the Greek might have played on a, a Sunday night show, maybe on uh, Piccadilly Radio. I started hearing this music. I'd never heard music like it in my life. It was just so um, punky but punky at the same time, you know what I mean? And it always sounded like it was about to fall apart. Even the records where they'd been in the studio and made a record, it just sounded like, this is all going to crumble any moment. And I really like that, that bagginess. It was baggy before I knew what baggy meant. You know, to me, baggy, it was, it was to do with the mantis scene, was never to do with the baggy clothes. It was always the bagginess of the music, you know what I mean? And I think the Mondays were the pioneers of that. Um, so, yeah, I fell in love with the music from day one. And, you know, it was, I think I was a big fan of the Stranglers, you know, and one of the things I loved about the Stranglers was the bass was always dominant and up front, you know, along with the keyboards. I think with Happy Mondays, I recognise that it was probably the first band since the Stranglers, to me, where the bass was monumental. You know what I mean? It's like you could tell this kid on bass knew how to write a good bass line and how to play it. So, you know, going back to like Cuff Dam and um, Tart Tart, it was the bass. The bass just carried it beautifully, you know. So, mm. yeah, I became a fan of Paul's work from day one. Um, I don't think I got to meet the Mondays proper until... Early 1987, we played the boardwalk. We supported them at the boardwalk. We were famous, the Inspiral Carpets were famous for supporting every bugger that came through the boardwalk. I think we support. We were like, we supported more bands there than, than any other band supported bands there. Um, I remember the night we played with the Mondays. I remember the sound check. I remember hanging out particularly with Mark. I you know, really bonded with Mark. First time I've met him. Um, but all the band, then and to this day, they're just a bunch of great souls, you know what I mean? That's how I've always felt about the Mondays and more so now than ever, really. Um, I think as you get older, you sort of do, you drop a lot of the shit that you you have around you when you're young, so there's, you know. And, um, but yeah, I mean, I, re I remember them all being great souls and, you know, I, I think I made some close friends from, from the end of the 80s with the Happy Mondays to the present day. I'm still close to all of them. Um, you know, I mean, they are some of my favourite people in the world are in that band, and now, oh. and, you know, and Paul was one of them, you know. Yeah, um, that's nice. And over the years, I always remember him being just a dead solid character. I know he had his, uh, he had his issues from time to time and his, um, you know, problems that he dealt with that were quite public knowledge at the time, but he, he was always a dead solid geezer and always had time. It felt like he always had time for me. And, um, yeah, he remained, he remained that great soul right until the last time I saw him. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and then he had his big arm moment where I think at the time when he had big arm, I got the feeling that he needed help with that band. I think mm -hmm. people would have preferred him to still be working with the Mondays, but he wanted to get that out of his system and he did so and he put out some great tracks and I had the pleasure of getting him on uh, XFM a couple of times on my evening show, it was at the time. Um, yeah, I mean, what a great man. What a great man and what, what a great musician. I think he's going to go down in... Uh, in the history books as one of the great musicians of this, this part of the world, and certainly of that genre, you know what I mean? Do you remember any specific anecdotes to do with your time when you supported the Mondays at the Boardwalk or in those early days? I remember anecdotes of seeing them 
in the Hacienda, but a lot of that's still not broadcastable, even though we all know what was going on. But Go it was on, quite shocking to see it. No, as a, as, no as a wide-eyed young lad, I, I was like raised in a corner shop in Oldham as a proper working class, you know, the son of a working class couple. Um, no, no drugs in my life, right up until, you know, that sort of era, I suppose, really. I never, never took drugs, never saw people doing drugs. It was just alien to me. And then suddenly you're in the Hacienda and there's these uh, scamps at the back that, you know, we heard were in a band and it, it was the Happy Mondays, this band that was seeing a new order. And there's all sorts going on in the, in the back there, on the back benches, in the little booths, you know. And yeah, we, 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 we know what was going on now in hindsight. But yeah, at the time it was a bit shocking. And it was the kind of world that I didn't really want to get too involved with. You know, I love the music, I love the band, the Happy Mondays, but um, I think our band were famously, we famously didn't get too into that drug scene. You know what I mean? Yeah. We didn't, we were by no means judgmental of anybody that was into it. It's just, I think as working class young lads from Oldham who'd, we'd had shit day jobs, some of us, and we didn't want to go back to that. So we really protected our band. We wanted to really make sure we survived it and, and, and made it for, you know, not just for this year. Let's make this, let's still be doing this in 10 years. I mean, here we are, 34 30 years after, years still doing later, it. Mind you, mind you, the Mondays did all the drugs and they're still going strong, aren't they? Looking better than ever. So, yeah, maybe it was us that lost out there. <laughs> should, have, should have gagged in there and got a bit. So who came first? Did the Inspirals come before the Mondays or was the Mondays slightly before the Inspirals? I think timing-wise, probably the same because... The seeds of the Inspirals started off in the early 80s. It was like Graham, guitarist, Stephen, the singer, who's, who's still the, the same guys I'm working with now. And, you know, I joined uh, 86, I think I joined the band. So, yeah, I think, I think time-wise, they probably both came out or came together about the same time, you know, in, in the, um, the aftermath of punk and everything that came around that time. I mean, the Inspirals were really big into the psychedelic furs. That was one of the big influences that made them start the band. And I think when they first became a band they were called the Furs really? after the Psychedelic Furs <laughs> and if you think about the name in Spiral Carpets it is like it's another version of Psychedelic Furs isn't it in Spiral oh, okay. Carpets yeah I yeah. didn't I've never the, you know, it's a, right but, yeah, yeah. But, well I've only figured it out in recent years but um, I've not even discussed that with Graham I keep meaning to mention it but because the story was always like they came up with the name by getting a dictionary and getting two words and it was Inspire and then Carpets but I think they wanted a name that sounded like Psychedelic Furs that's what I think my journey through life got so much better than what I had planned the moment I met the Inspirals and joined that band, you know what I mean? Because um, punk had changed my life. At 1976, I saw the Pistols at the Electric Circus in December 76. So they did the free trade all in summer, which I wasn't at that gig, but then they came back in December, played the Electric Circus, and it had the same effect on me that night that it had on the 40-odd people that were in the free trade all gig. I just dropped everything, dropped out of college. I was at art college, potentially going to university to do a, you know, a degree in art or whatever, diploma in art. And I just dropped a lot and got out of there because I wanted to get into bands and being on stage. And it took me a few years, but that's how I ended up on that journey that led me to join the Inspirals. And you know, here we are now in 2023, we're back on the road and it's the most, I'm enjoying this too and more than I've ever enjoyed my time with the Inspirals in the past. I think because we are older, and there's less issues, less baggage, more appreciation. Um, you know, we've lost a lot of friends over the years, haven't we? Isn't it incredible, though, that you can go to one concert and literally your life traje trajectory changes overnight from yeah. that? That's the power of music, isn't it? That's the power yeah, totally. of... Yeah, totally. It really... was for me. I, I, I'd grown up in love with music, obsessed with music. I'd grown up loving Elvis Presley through the late 60s and the 70s. I was into 50s rock and roll music. Um, I was quite obsessive about music generally, but I never really thought I could do anything about it because kids like me from Oldham, working class kids from a town like Oldham with no music skill whatsoever, just didn't end up on top of the pops. So it was that moment of seeing that night when I saw on stage at the Electric Circus, it was the Buzzcocks, Johnny Thunder's Heartbreakers, The Clash and The Pistols. Wow. And wow. seeing seeing like literally working class kids. I mean Steve Diggle out at the Buzzcocks. I was at art college with his brother Phil. So I'm stood there like watching Steve Diggle playing bar chords because he wasn't like Townsend esque then like he is now. It's a pretty simple, you know, um guitar bar chords, if you remember either, but it was like 
I could do that. He, he's, he's, he lives near us and his dad's a truck driver. You know, my mum and dad have got a kind of shop. And it's just like, I just thought, that's, I can do it now, I can do it. You know, you don't have to be a great musician and you don't have to have a, you know, Pete Shelley sounded as broad as I did. You know what I mean? Didn't he? He just had the same, you know, albeit from a different yeah. suburb of Manchester. But, so it's just something like, God, I can do that and I'm going to do it. And that's it, dropped everything and set off down that path. Do you think? But yeah, so they like say it can be a single gig. It can be for some people, it can be a single record, can't it? Or it can be yeah. a book that you read, right. and that changes your life. But to me, that that night, 9th of December, nineteen seventy six, was my my road to Damascus experience. Absolutely! Wow, amazing, amazing. Do you think that the Mondays and the Inspirals could have influenced kids in the same way further on down the line? Yeah, I, I think at the time I wouldn't have imagined that was going to happen, but I've seen it in um, in retrospect. Yeah. I meet a lot of people that were inspired by our scene particularly, but I meet I meet a lot of people that were inspired by you know the the keyboard sound that I played because at that point nobody nobody in this part of the world had a screaming farfisa as no. a lead instrument. No. You know, it's like some bands would go for the the Hammond sound. You know, that was yeah. a go to sort of. Uh, cool organ sound in the 80s but I went for something that was much more shrill more yeah. cutting it was more, more like a just a, a scream you know what I mean and um so yeah I think we, we did inspire people I mean the Mondays inspired me no end I was like very vocal back then about the fact that every time I went seeing an Happy Mondays gig I literally was like down for the next two days because I just thought we we can't do what they're doing we can't be that good they're they're, they're another level they're otherworldly you know what I mean and I'd come away and literally just beating myself up about how shit we were. And then oh. it took me a couple of days for people to say, no, you're not, you're great, you're good. You I'm like, you yeah. shiver? Are we good? I'll give it another <laughs> go then. You know what I mean? But, um... Yeah, and then, it, I mean, I wrote a song on um, one of my Clint Boone Experience albums, in, which I did in the late, late night, is um, Presley on Oldham Street, and it's a spoken word opening track of an album. And that, that old title, Presley Walks, it's based on the, the lyric that I wrote, uh, Presley Walks Down Oldham Street, singing Cuff Dam, Cuff Dam, Cuff Dam. And that was all inspired by seeing Sean of the Mondays in Oldham Street, Saturday afternoon on his way to Affleck to wherever he was going. And it's like, the, you know, there's, there's references like that right. along my sort of timeline that are purely to show me love for the Happy Mondays. You know right. what I mean? Right. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're all, the, the Inspirals were all massive Mondays fans all, all the way through. And there's a little funny blip where there was something in one of the music papers. I think John Robb did a piece in Sounds or Melody Maker. And it was a big piece on the Mondays. And he phoned me. I remember before him up, I was at home and he said, Do you want to give us a quote about the Mondays? And I did this glowing review about how much I loved them and all that. And I can't remember the exact wording of it, but it's probably still out there on the internet. But Sean took it the wrong way. I think he took it as me. I don't know, being condescending or being patronising or criticising, but I wasn't, it's purely, I, I love that band. And I think for a few weeks after that, there was a bit of sniping in the press and I think Sean had a go at us. And, and then our lads, our rhythm section, had, had a go at him in one of the magazines. So Good. it was that usual little, it was, it was the press putting things up, putting people yeah. up against each other. Not as serious as the, um, the Blur and Oasis one right. that came later on. Certainly yeah. not as, you know, mainstream news, yeah. headline news, but... Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, even during that blip, I just thought, I love this band and, uh, you know, I'm going to stick with them. And yeah. we went through a period of every time we put a single out, probably from 92 to 94, we'd get a fax from Sean in the factory. He was in the factory offices. He'd send us a fax saying, love that new single, top new single, carpet heads or whatever he'd put. So, oh, that's nice. Yeah. Nice. Later on in life, when Sean was going through his, um, that period where he was financially crippled because of the management yeah. problem that he had. And during that time, I got a call from Bez because I was doing a lot of DJing at that point. And Bez called me up saying, can you get X some DJ work? You need some, some money coming in. So from that moment, I was getting Sean a lot of work. We're doing a lot of DJ gigs together. And that was lovely. I'm driving up and down the country with him in my car, my little Saab, and he'd be in the passenger seat here and, you know, reminiscing. And I think that was one of my favourite times of my, my career, my working life, really, being... Hanging out with Sean and going to these weird little towns doing DJ sets together and then getting him back home, getting him, packing him off to bed and all that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just, um, yeah, I, I love the fact that we're still 
still mates. You know, even now, you know, I think every every week I have contact with at least one of them, whether it's Bez or Oetta or Mark and Sean. It's just like really nice family to be part of. You know what I mean? We did a tour together, didn't we? Was it back in 20, 2012, was it ish? We, we did a tour where we supported the Mondays on some big gigs, pretty big gigs, and that, that again was a really nice um, tour to be part of. Because, you know, we're all a bit older and greyer now, and we're just all just more, well, more, more tolerant of everything these days and more appreciative of everything. How did you um, feel when the when the Mondays reformed in twenty? They, they, so there, there'd been a long time when the original lineup weren't together, and then in twenty yeah. and Sean had been touring with session players and and stuff under the Mondays name. But then they all got back together in twenty twelve with the original lineup, yeah. even including PD. Do you remember yeah. having feelings about that particular time? Were you pleased? Yeah, that was buzzing, but just absolutely. Yeah, I get. I get. Yeah, I mean, they, just being. As objective as I can, forgetting my friendship with the band and my, my relationship, as a fan of the Happy Mondays, seeing that lineup come back together was like perfect. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, and then to end up playing with them on that tour was even yeah. better. Yeah. Um, so what was it like? What What was the difference? You You supported them in the very early days, and you supported them again in that 2012 period. How had yeah. thing? How had the backstage? Uh, situation evolved or changed between those two eras? Less drugs, <laughs> more early nights. <laughs> <laughs> but it was what it was like. I think I think Sean was pretty much after every gig, he'd be getting off back to the hotel to get his head down or whatever. And yeah. you know, we were that's that's the world we're in at the moment. You know, I'm I'm, I'm still I like an early night. I mean, to be honest, I mean, I've got I, I don't have any days off, so we're touring at the moment, and the days when we're not gigging with the Inspirals, I'm on the radio, so I'm coming straight from gigs to come and do the radio show and that, so, uh, but yeah, just, I think you learn to just handle yourself and look after yourself a bit more as you get older, don't you? Right, yeah. So, I mean, I, I like a drink, I'm li I like a drink, but I'm not tanning the booze as such, you know, even on a, a night where, you know, I've got a night out with the band after a gig, still, you know, I'm still coherent, not, not being sick on myself like I used to be back in the olden days. <laughs> I mean, it's not a good look, is it, at my age? <laughs> So let's go back in time again. So you, we, we briefly touched on Big Arm. Um, mm. Were you surprised that Paul decided to sing? I remember I, I wasn't surprised that he was singing because I'd done a similar thing myself. After the Inspirals took a break from 95, I set up the Clint Boone experience because I always wanted to be a singer. I didn't want to be a keyboard player. My main yeah. idea as a kid, but I grew up wanting to be Elvis Presley. That's as simple as that. You know, from being like seven or eight, I just wanted to be Elvis Presley. So I didn't want to play keyboards. That was a complete accident. Right. But um, yeah, so I, you know, when I got the chance after the Inspirals took a break in '95, I started this other band, and that was all about me singing, and I really enjoyed it. So I think when when I saw Paul doing a similar thing, I could totally relate to it. Okay, so moving forward in 2014, I think it was, um, we asked if you were DJ at Chico's fundraiser and you kindly yeah. agreed to do that. Do, do you have any memories of that night or of, of that event? Uh, it, yeah, it, it was lovely. I mean, because it was obviously, it was a bit of a news story at the time, wasn't it? The, mm -hmm. the, the cannabis oil treatment and yeah. all that. But back then it was a bit like, um, I remember it being in the news before I, I, I even heard about the, the fundraiser or whatever. But um, yeah, and I remember me and Chico that night. I'm sure I met him earlier in his life, but I remember that night just what what a joy it was being with him, and he's a, a joyous person, isn't he? By by nature, and but um, yeah, I mean, I, I just thought that that event was amazing, and I loved being part of it. Um, and I didn't see him again then for for a while until well, until recently. That was the last time I saw him, I think, until the funeral. There's a lot to feel thankful of, isn't there, when you're in that situation surrounded with nice people like that? It is, and and. The funeral in particular made me realise that I need to make more of an effort to gather people. Like it, it just felt, it, it felt sad that we all gathered and there was a, so much love in the room, but it was underpinned with grief. And like yeah. we need to have more parties that celebrate happy things, don't we? Yeah. Tell you something that, that happened at the funeral that yeah. I've not told many people about, but it's a really 
yeah. funny anecdote, and Paul would piss himself if he could hear this. So we've got a, a pet lizard. We've got a lot of, well, we, we, at that point, we had a lot of pet animals, and I think we've lost a few over the last few months, but we've got a lizard called Manny, Manny Rango, and he's about 10 or 11 years old, a bearded dragon. <laughs> and the only, the only thing that he'll eat is these, what they call Murray worms, or it's like a mealworm, a big fat worm yeah. with like a shell-like body. And um, these are the only thing that he'll eat. He won't eat all the things that lizards traditionally eat. He's not interested. So I get these worms. And I feed them with, you know, carrot and uh, broccoli and greens, whatever I'd like to be in the lizard. I feed these worms on it. And then I feed the worms to Manny. And he attacks them like a, like a dinosaur. Because they are actually related to dinosaurs, aren't they, lizards? So we've got these worms. Anyway, occasionally, they'll escape from Manny's vivarium, as it's called, like his tank. Um, and they end up on the floor of the room where the viv vivarium is. It's a weird word, word isn't it, the vivarium? So anyway, there's been a couple of occasions where I've turned up to do a DJ gig and one of these worms has appeared because it's, it's escaped and it ends up, when I put my DJ bags down, <laughs> it'll climb in and come on the DJ trip with me. But the most spectacular one was when I got to Paul's The Wake after the, after the church, I got there a little bit early to set up and there was a few people in the room and obviously the, the, the tone was still a bit subdued, you know, because the... I mean, the, the service was beautiful, wasn't it? I mean, what a, what a legend, Rueta. That was yeah. like, wow. But um, so I'm there setting up and there's, um, you know, black black sheets on the table and I'm getting my DJ gear ready. And suddenly I see on the floor the biggest worm and it's just like that. Right? And I'm thinking, right, there's people mourning <laughs> Paul, like within, within a few feet of me, there's people sat here waiting for the rest of the people. To, and I'm there and thinking, there's a worm near my feet and I've got to pick it up and dispose it. I'm not going to kill it because I don't do that. Well, I feed them to a lizard. I suppose that's just as bad, isn't it? But it's worms there and I'm thinking, oh, fucking hell, it's, this is somebody's work. It's Paul Ryder's work and I've got a big fat worm here. I need to shift. Anyway, so what I did, I managed to pick it up. The doors were all shut. I couldn't figure out the top of the doors because all like emergency exits behind me. Nobody had yeah. opened any doors yet. So I picked it up and I walked the full length of the room and put it behind a curtain at the far corner. I thought it's probably going to come out later on, but... I couldn't do anything else with it. You know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to kill it. I didn't want to put it out down the toilet or anything. So I did, I did I, I, but that was the start of my, Brilliant. Brilliant. my, my moments at the, the wake of Paul Ryder with me having an encounter with a big fat mealworm. <laughs> but let's say he would have loved that, wouldn't he? He would, he would have loved it. <laughs> it's symbolic in some way, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you remember where... I wonder where... where that worm is now. It's probably still out there, you know. It's it probably still crawling been... around that venue. Yeah. yeah. You could have put it in a yeah. sandwich or something. Oh. Someone could... <laughs> probably climbed up the curtain watching everybody. Yeah, look. <laughs> I do particularly like your impression of the worm. I could do it better when I'm laid down, but I'm not, not doing that oh, now. No, OK. But... <laughs> <laughs> do you remember where you were when you heard that he died? Do you remember what, how you felt? Um, I think I was in here. I think I was in, on, on the radio, in the radio studio, I think, when I heard the news. Um, yeah, I think I was in here, and I think I phoned my wife right away to say, I've just heard Paul's passed away. Um, yeah, devastated, really. I mean, I've lost a lot, of, a lot of us have lost a lot of people over the last few years, and not necessarily to COVID, but during the pandemic, it felt like, we're just losing a lot of people, you know, particularly in in this industry. You know, Pete Mitchell, yeah. Dave Booth, Denise. Um, it just like it just seemed like every week there was somebody else um, going. But yeah, Paul, I, th I don't know. It just it shocked me. I don't know. It, I mean, yeah, it was profound, isn't it? When you lose somebody like that, there's certain people in your life that you think are just always going to be there, and I think Paul. Well, all the Mondays, it feels like they're all always going to be there, you know, and then suddenly one of them's gone. Um, yeah, I was, I was devastated. Um, I remember when, when his dad died, you know, I mean, I went, that, that was a shock. I know it was several years ago, but um, I got onto both right away and just said, you know, real story was top bloke, you know, never any memories I had of Derek were positive memories, same as with Paul. Yeah. Um, and I think I did a little tribute for his dad on the radio show at the time, oh, I think, did and you? Sent, the, sent the recording through to Paul, yeah. And it, uh, 
But yeah, it's. Um, right. I know that we all, you know, our time comes on it, but it just sometimes it just don't feel right or fair, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you think his legacy is? Like, what do you think that he's left behind that will be remembered? Well, the obvious one is his, his bass playing because that's there for eternity now, isn't it? Mm. Um, and it is, you know, as a musician, he is probably, he probably well, I mean, I was going to say he's, he's probably the greatest musician in the Mondays, but Gaz is pretty cool as well, and you know what I mean? I mean, I don't consider me to be a great musician. I always said Craig Gill, our drummer, was the, the best musician in our band. Um, and I think what what Paul brought to the Mondays was something that was, um, you know, very very special as a, as a musician. For for a bassist to make that much of a, an impact in in the mix, uh, and I suppose for the band to be cool with it being that loud as well, because I think in a lot of bands it'd be like, no, you're only bass, put that down. I want my vocals up front, and oh, Clint wants his organ really loud. Um, but yeah, I think that's the main part of his legacy is his bass playing, but. You know, the amount of stories you hear about, you know, his humour, uh, his career inside, you know, be, being a great human being. Um, quite humble as well, you know what I mean? He, I don't think he was the kind that'd ever saunter into a room like I do, shout Boone Army. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. Where do you want me? Where am I sitting? You know, he just, I think he was quite, quite understated, wasn't he, in the way he handled himself in public. I remember one, another off the subject a little bit, but you know the story that's in 24 hour party people about them poisoning the pigeons? So I remember, this is way before I knew the Mondays, I probably wasn't even in a band at the time, but I remember that story being the headlines on the Manchester News about these pigeons suddenly dropping out of the sky in Piccadilly at gardens. <laughs> Can you tell the story because in case, for, for people that don't know it, just explain what that is? Um, they got a load of rat poison. They got onto the top of the um, Piccadilly Plaza, or whatever it's called. It's a car park up there. Um, in fact, Piccadilly Radio used to be up there as well. And they just fed all this rat I think it was rat poison, to um, the pigeons. And the pigeons gobbled it up, because that's what pigeons do. Um, and next thing, they're, they're like, literally dropping out of the sky into Piccadilly Gardens and on, onto people's heads. And cars driving through. <laughs> but it's just, um, I remember that story happening. I didn't know the, the riders at the time. But I remember it being a, a big news story. So another anecdote, when, when the first time the Inspirals ever did a gig abroad was out in, uh, near Valencia in Spain. And it was, oh, let me think what year, probably 87, 1987, I'm guessing it would have been. Um, and it was on the bill was just a lot of British bands. So the, the Pop Guns were one of the bands, the Upper Mondays Inspirals, the Lars played. Um, and it was the gig where, it was a weird it was like Valencia, but not near the coast. It was inland. And it was a weird single or two-story sort of complex. It was like it had a casino vibe to it. And I think in the middle of it was like the um, cloisters or whatever where the bands were playing. And it turned out to be a brothel, we found out later on. Um, but not that you'd notice. There was nothing like that going on on the night that we noticed. Just somebody told us afterwards, oh, yeah, it's a brothel, that place. But anyway, so we got into town in the afternoon. And the Mondays... Um, went down to the beach. So this is a gig where Sean fell asleep on the beach in the sun with no cream on, no sun cream on. Um, I think he had his shirt on, but anyway, it, when he woke up, he was really severely burnt to his hands, his feet and his, his face. And they all thought it was dead funny to just leave him there in the sun. So he ended up, I don't know if he had to go, he might have had to go to hospital, but he ended up with like caked in cream and bandages. And he did this gig. Um, and they went on about, I think they were due on at like seven o'clock in the morning or something. Like it was one of these gigs that went on right through the night. I think they were like, they, they might have been the headline band. They were on at like seven o'clock in the morning and it was just proper wild. These, these bunch of mad people from Manchester who we didn't really know all that well still at this point. Um, but yeah, Sean just really severely sunburned. I bet there's pictures out on the internet somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, he wasn't in a good place at the time. But that's what we, I saw the Lars as well. Like this was the first time I'd seen the Lars play. And then I remember, I think we played and they might be due on a bit later. But anyway, it was like sometime through the night, we're up on the roof of this brothel 
in this really beautiful part. It was like in the desert outside Valencia. And the Lars were all, there was five of them, so I think four in the band, and maybe the driver or road. But they all had acoustic guitars and they're all just singing and jamming. And it was just beautiful to see. Yeah. Uh, and they were doing covers and then they'd be doing one of their own and then somebody would shout out, B-Fart, and they'd go into a B-Fart track. Or whatever. But that was mesmerising to see. And I've said a lot of times in interviews that that was like when I thought, um, Scousers are like born to make music, whereas I think Manx like we're born loving music and we have to work a bit towards playing. But Scousers that night, just, those five were just like they were born to play acoustic guitar. That's how it looked, you know, just so easy and, um, you know, fluent and part of the part of the part of the being was that they could all play acoustic guitar beautifully and sing like, you know, birds. It's just incredible. In terms mm. of. The Liverpool Manchester thing, Do, like I know that the the Mondays have a re or had a really good relationship with the farm, and there was a lot of kind of yeah. mutual love and support there. Did you find that as well? That that you know, even I mean, obviously in football it's not quite the same thing, but in music, what, do you find that bands from the same city and the same region tend to support each other rather than than see each other as competition? I felt within the Manchester music scene there was always support. I think we all, like when we saw, you know, we, we, nearly, we were nearly the first band of the Manchester scene to get into the top 40. We had, I think we had number 41 with Move. And then a couple of weeks after, it was the Roses, Fool's Gold. And was that the same night the, the Mondays one as well, I think? Top, they were on yeah. top of the Pops the same night, yeah. yeah. So we missed out. We, we, if we'd have got one or two places higher with Move, we would have been the first band to do Top of the Pops of the Manchester scene. But, but what I was saying is, seeing them lot do it was like, this is brilliant. This is helping us. Our next single, we're bound to get in the fort, which we did. So it was always, we all realised that we're part of the same sort of movement or same machine. Um, so yeah, to me it was always, and like I said, you know, I'd watch the Happy Mondays and think, God, go oh good. And we, you know, we should just sack it off now. That's how, you know, that's the impression that, I, that it had on me. But yeah, so very supportive as, as musicians. Um, but yeah, in terms of the other city, I mean, I wasn't into football at that point. I'd, I'd been football off a long time before that. But I remember in the early 80s going to Liverpool to watch bands like R.E.M. or the Bunny Men. We'd go over there and watch these gigs at the, uh, the Royal Court. Um, and it'd be me, Chris Goodwin and Manny. This was like our little gang at the time. This was before the, the Roses and before these spirals. Um, and we'd like to have a little sort of pact where when we got into Liverpool, don't let anybody hear you talking. You know what I mean? It was like, it was, it was a... It was a dangerous time to be a mank going to a gig in Liverpool. That was in the early 80s until 83, 84, that was the case. And it was only when, when things started happening in the Hacienda and ecstasy started getting to be part of the scene and the rave thing started. It was only from then on where you could really go and celebrate your mankness with your scouse counterparts, you know what I mean, and, and vice versa. So in terms of the relationships that we've had and that I've had with those Liverpool bands, always some of the closest friends again, you know, like The Farm, Ian McNabb, The Bunny Men. It's just like it, the Lars, I mean, I still see John Power a lot. Um, never any rivalry, never any, like a lot of banter in the early days, but just we're all part of the same thing. We're from the North and we're making music. We've all been inspired by the same kind of people, whether it is The Beatles or Jefferson Airplane or Uncadelli, you know, we're all, we're all of that same. We're, we're all cut off the same block of wood, really, aren't we? Whether we're, we're Manx or Scousers, you know what I mean? And you're right that that one band's success actually makes the other bands more more likely to be successful if it because they're yeah. all part of the same movement. So you're drawing attention yeah. to each other as well in totally, the success. Yeah. And I'm really glad that it was seen that way and not a, as being competitive and and kind yeah. of rival rivalry. It, it's it, yeah. It, it does feel very I mean, I, I, supportive. I, I talk at the moment as well, when we first heard Fool's Gold, because that was like a, a game-changing record, that one. Like, we were driving south to do a gig. We were somewhere on the M6, and it came on it. I think it was Simon Bates on Radio 1 that played it, bizarrely, somebody like that. And it was like, fucking hell, this is... Everything's changing now. This is different. This is, and it wasn't like... It wasn't jealousy. It was just like... Things are going to change now in, in a, a great way, probably. We all felt like we had to up our game a bit. And before you know it, we're all doing a bit of funky drumming in our, in our songs, you know what I mean? 
I think our, our nearest one was, I think probably Caravan was the single that we did soon after that we had a, a straight funky drummer sort of beat. And it was like, that was our homage to what the, um, the Roses had started doing really. Um, but yeah, again, it wasn't, that wasn't rivalry. It was just like, they've created something beautiful there and let's, let's crack on and see what we can create that's beautiful. And I think we did subsequently make some beautiful records. But yeah, the way I've always seen it is it's, um, yeah, it's always been supportive. I don't know if, it, if I'd, I would have feel if we'd have just had one single and split up, I might have been a bit bitter and twisted now. You know what I mean? I might have said, yeah, but our single was better than any of them. And, <laughs> and we didn't get anywhere. <laughs> Are you doing a new album with the Inspirals? We're not planning it yet, but I've got a feeling the logical result of what's happening, or the, the logical next step is at some point. Yeah, we, I mean, we're just celebrating the back catalogue now, but I think at some right. point. And we've got a bit of new blood in the team now as well, because we've got um, a guy called Jake Fletcher on drums, who's pretty much replicating Craig's beats. You know, and he's still doing his own thing as well. We've said that, you know, you can totally, you know, be Kev, be Kev Clark as much as, you want to be Craig Gill. But, um, and we've got our boy, Oscar on bass. He's an amazing musician as well. So what I'm saying for the first time ever, we've got some incredible musicians in the band, you know what I mean? Because we've always been like garage, you know, punk, you know. But well, suddenly we've got these kids that could probably knock out a great, we could probably do a great Fleetwood Mank album. <laughs> you know what I mean? Brilliant. <laughs> oh, no, no. I mean, I think one thing that we probably will do is when Craig passed away in 2016, we'd been working on some recordings for what would have been the next album. So we've got quite a few things in the can that I think it'd be nice to finish that at some point as a tribute to Craig, you know, his final work. Yeah. Um, so I think that's very likely to happen. It's funny you, should say, I do feel you, funny you should say that, actually, because Paul, for years and years and years, the whole band, apart from Sean, has wanted to do a new album. And uh, right. Sean never would. Paul said he's. Okay. I've written twenty bass lines, like new bass lines for the Mondays. Or, or maybe it'd be a separate album completely, and the band just puts the tunes around that. But yeah, I mean, I'm really into things like that, you know. And um, yeah, I mean, there's uh, like I said, the, the the Craig recordings. It'd be a shame to just have them left on a shelf. Cause, Absolutely, yeah. You know, and um, lovely to and Craig... keep him to keep his memory alive and his work alive. Yeah. Well, did you see? Did you see the tribute we did to Craig recently? Because, like, during the the tour that we're doing at the moment, we have like the beginning of the encore. There's a film of Craig that comes up. So it's just it's all movie footage that I've shot of him over the years, and we have that behind us. And then his name and the dates. But for the Manchester gig, his son Levon, who's seventeen, came and drummed "Commercial Rain" oh, uh, while it. his dad's tributes behind him. And he looks at, Levon looks exactly like his dad. Bright red hair, freckles, big cheeky smile. And um, oh, it was just incredible. We just absolutely smashed it. It was beautiful. And the crowd was just like in I bits. Bet it brought you know what the yeah, brought the house yeah. down a bit. Yeah, I mean, they, they probably that, that gig to me is like probably the most important and I like gig we've ever done. You know, I mean, we did, we did things like we had lined at Reading 1990. I was there. Yeah. I was there. I was oh, at the, that the, Reading there. gig with amazing fireworks. Yeah, on, on, on the first song. I was we, we, had, we had the no, fireworks. It was at the end. It was at the end of no, it was at the beginning. Oh, we, did, we probably did the end as well. At the very end, it was we, we amazing. Did, yeah. Yeah, we, we decided on the day to let a lot of the fireworks off as we came on stage because people never did that. They do it at the end of the gig. And it was just, I think on the day we said, yeah, let's, as we're coming on stage, set the fireworks off, which we did. But yeah, we had some at the end as well. And then big spotlights. I was working at MTV at the time and a load of us went down there and, and I knew... Yeah. I think Mikey, do you, you know Mikey Lights, the lighting guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I think he yeah. was in the lighting booth, so I was standing in the lighting booth with him when you were on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant, like, amazing show. Yeah. Wasn't yeah. it? And, and we had it, we bought a video camera specially to record that gig, and video cameras then were like on your shoulder. No, I mean, this is a domestic, so not a professional film, but we bought one. It was like a few thousand quid, and it was like, yeah. Just we forgot to film it, <laughs> and there's all the, there's one bootleg film on the internet somewhere of somebody with a really shit camcorder. But I see all the record of that that event. But, but going back to the monumental gigs, so we did that. We did we had line GMX in '99 to like all the other Manchester bands did. But the gig we did at the Albert Hall last week, because it was the, our first time together in seven and a half years, 
I know through those years we were we all all thought it's not going to happen again. We'd all written it off. We, we didn't want to do it without Craig. And then suddenly we're doing it. We're getting the band back out. That gig was just, you know, if there's one gig that I'd like to be judged and remembered by for the Inspirals, that'd be it. Because we pulled we pulled the rabbits out. The arts like absolute fucking ma magicians. We just we smashed it that night. And um, to get leave on on at the end, and it was just like it's it, it like you know like in moments like that you think he'd sort of you know amble onto the stage, get behind his kit drum and then do a little celebration bow at the end. He walked on stage, I introduced him. Nobody knew we were doing it. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, leave on Gil. Craig's film's going at the back. And he walks up to the, the microphone and just goes, All right, Manchester! Like that before he'd even drummed. A big seller. And I'm thinking, well, I hope he gets I hope he does it right now. But anyway, he smashed it. Really beautiful performance then. At the end came out, did a bow, brought the house down, threw his sticks out and all that. Just a it was just an incredible gig, and I think to me, like I said, the, the, the most important gig that we've ever pulled off, I think that. Excellent. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Amazing. Is there anything I've missed? Are there any other uh, anecdotes or incidents or times when you've crossed Paul's path that you got a story about? That's it, really. But what, what a geezer and... Uh... Like with a lot of them, it's a pity we never got a chance to say, because you never know it's the last time you're going to see these people, do you? So, but he'll be watching us. He knows. He knows. I've got. I've got a feeling that. I've got a feeling that that, that worm on the floor at the, the wake. That was probably him coming back to, say, you know, see you soon, Boone. And you didn't have any. Un <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't have any unfinished business with him. Like it, it's not like you know the. Things were left on a bad note. Like it's that's what I'm really grateful for is that me and him were yeah. good after like breaking up a marriage and we were good. We got through all that and it, and so like, I feel quite peaceful about about it. Yeah. Same here. I mean, I never. I don't really have. I don't really have fallouts with people. Really. I mean, that's not in my nature. So no, no, definitely not any unfinished business and. I think, like you said before, I think I, I could, I can be, I can rest assured that he died thinking I was an all right bloke. You know what I mean? Absolutely. No, I know he really loved you. He was really grateful to you for, like, not just the big arm support, but the thing you did with for Chico and just generally being. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're a great person. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm all right. No, it's it's, it's lovely. <laughs> no, but and, I, I'm, I, and I'm really, really grateful to you for your generosity of spirit. Just. No. It's a pleasure. It's just it's beautiful to be part of that family of you know not not just the Mondays but the the, the other guys, you know the the new order lot and the Roses and what a family of people you know what I mean and what what a great bunch of records we've made between us. And you know what, what I mean? an amazing thing you've done for the city, really. I mean, you've really mm. put the city on the on the musical map. The, le yeah. the legacy, it's amazing. Collectively, yeah, yeah. totally, yeah. Collectively, and it's uh, we've got a big a big thank you to Tony Wilson as well, isn't it for absolutely, yeah, like. Sh shepherding us together and yeah. putting us on that pedestal and yeah. you know what I mean it's like I saw, it's uh, I, saw a, a a I saw a really funny thing on uh, it's on YouTube and it's something that was made for schools programs um, right. about independent record labels I'll send you I'll send you the link because it's worth watching and it's from like the uh, mid 80s probably and tone is in it and it's made for schools but it's all about the happy Mondays and the, and the business of the happy Mondays <laughs> And there's a bit with Tony <laughs> Michaelides um, being annoyed because the Mondays didn't turn up for an interview and they were really late right. or something. And Tony's sitting there and he said, well, I understand why you're upset, Tony. He said, but you know what? The truth is, I really quite like that. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and that, that, like, they, without Tony, if they'd been signed to a major label, they would have been dropped for lack of professionalism. Yeah, totally. Oh, yeah. But yeah. that lack of professionalism is what was magical about them, that out of the ramshackleness came this magic that would have been shut yeah. down if they'd been with a major and, label. And they are like lovable outlaws, aren't they? Yeah. And it, they're the, truly the, the, the two of them particularly. Because they don't, yeah. they don't fake it. Like, if, if they don't like something, you'll know that. And, and yeah. I think yeah. they, they always lived completely authentically. They didn't yeah. fake it for the for the record label because they didn't need to. Totally. Tony was yeah. so permissive in that way because he was smart yeah. and he knew that that's that's how to how to deal with a band like the Mondays and that's how to get the magic out of them. Yeah. 
So I'll, I'll, send, job, you, I'll send you the link to it because it's really interesting. Like with all these years later, it's it's a yeah. brilliant bit of book made for schools programs of all things. That's, there's so, so many contradictions within that sentence, isn't there? Like, <laughs> yeah. Tony Wilson, Happy Mondays, school program. School program. Yeah, be I careful. Know. I know. <laughs> it was brilliant. Brilliant. All right, Clint, thank you so, so much again. Really, really You're very helpful. welcome, Ange. It's been great talking to you. All right. Brilliant. Right, well, Thanks. hopefully see you soon. If we get the band out to the California, I'll give you a shout. Oh, please do. Please do. I'm yeah. there. I'm there. I'll be at Brilliant. the front. All right. It's great thank seeing you. you. All right, Ange. Lots, lots of love to you. All right. See you a bit. Take care. Say hello to Chico for me. He's lovely, Clint, isn't he? Oh, thanks, Clint, for being so amazing. That's all we've got for you this week, which actually it's not all we've got for you this week because coming up right now, well, at nine o'clock, so in a few minutes, is another live stream that's happening with the legendary Phil Sachs, who we promised you last week. If you want to join, look for the details of the Zoom call in the chat and you can ask Phil your own question face to face so uh, just have a look in the chat now if you're watching this live and you can get the details and join us we're playing out with another big arm chat this is flexing and keep listening to the end to hear what i can only assume is a homage to the human league it's absolutely brilliant i love it it is of course from paul Ryder's big arm album radiator which is out now we will be back again, same time, same place, next week. And if you can't wait for the next episode, it's just dropped right now on all of the podcast platforms. And the video premiere will be here as usual next week. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. Just click on subscribe, we won't spam you, I promise. And give us a nice review on any of those podcast platforms. On behalf of Paul Anthony Ryder, I would like to thank each and every one of you individually for all the love and support that you give us. I absolutely love this community that we're building and we've got lots, lots more treats in store for everybody. Lots and lots of love to all of you. Big, big love and thanks to the legend that is Clint Boone. And of course, as usual, we give it up to the man himself, the late, great, Paul Anthony Ryder. Have a fantastic week and see you soon. See you soon in the chat with Phil Sachs. Lots of love. Bye.
Listening Productions. Yeah.